are going to be discussing responding to racial injustice, a Google perspective. So our moderator for this conversation is Maria Penga Wallace. We also have Noah Samuels, Thomas Harwell, and Rosalind Floor Bochak. Please welcome them to the stage. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Black Tech Fest. Wonderful to see you all. So we are in day three. Thank you, Google, for joining us on this very important conversation about responding to racial injustice. Now, I'm going to ask you to do an introduction in a moment, but before you do, I'm going to intro myself. <laughs> I'm Maria Penga Wallace. I'm the advanced lead at Color in Tech, and I lead on the program for all of you mid to senior level tech folks. So please do sign up at our booth on the way out. So. OK, we know that this is a very important conversation. Before we get started, it would be lovely to hear about your roles and what that involves. Who would like to go first? I will I go first. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's so, so good to be here today to talk about racial justice and um, yeah, to have this conversation with all of you. My name is Rosalind Bochak. I am a business application lead at Google, uh, looking after UK market. And um, I'm also part of the Black Google Network, EMEA STECO. So I've been part of this organization for, at Google for six years and part of the member of BGN for nearly four years. And it's also important, I am a mother of four boys. Whoa, oh, I love that. Round of applause for the four boys. <laughs> Thank you. Your motherhood. My name is Thomas Harwell. I currently serve as the head of diversity recruiting at Google for Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. And what that means is in the 33 countries where we hire, we have commitments to black and brown people, women in tech, and communities with disabilities largely, and how we make sure we create access and opportunity for those folks to join Google as we become the organization we want to be. I'm Noah Samuels. Uh, I've been at Google 15 years. I lead uh, the EMEA go-to-market operations team, which covers our ads business uh, across the region. Uh, I also lead our racial equity working group, which we set up after the murder of George Floyd. And I'm a member of our DEI council, sitting with the senior leadership uh, to look at all of our DEI initiatives uh, across the region. Thank you so much. So I should say to all of you that we're going to have a conversation for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we will open it out to you to, for you to ask your questions. So you know, do have them prepared and have a think about them as we go through the conversation. So my first question is, what does responding to racial injustice actually look like at Google? Could somebody talk us through that? I'll talk you through it, but I told you this one makes me nervous. <laughs> uh, I love this question, but I think inherent in the conversation around racial justice for companies and organization is the acknowledgement that there is some set of injustice largely for black and brown people. And so I think for Google, when we talk about the murder of George Floyd, we had a really visible letter from our CEO come out. And in that letter, we acknowledge the racial injustice in society and tech that Google plays a part in changing. And in there, I think there were several sets of commitment. So one to our people, how do we make sure we have access for underrepresented or historically marginalized groups coming into Google? Once those folks are at Google, how do we make sure we keep them there, that they're included in their experience, that they can be promoted and move through the organization um, in a way that is good and fair and equitable? Uh, then I think the next one was to our products. How do we make sure our products actually support the outcomes that we want for all of our users? Uh, and then I think there was some work around economic empowerment and opportunity. What are the investments Google is going to make to help right the wrongs of history, the past, or this current moment? And then education, uh, both education for Googlers. What is it that we need to learn in order to have a more just organization? but then also education more broadly outside of our organization. So I think that question of justice has an undertone of you know, self-awareness that things are not where you would like them to be, and then committing to the different work streams and paths that are gonna help you get there. 
That's really interesting, and it, it's across a lot of different strategic areas for the company. And we'll talk a little in a moment about you know how you're getting on in, in reaching those commitments, what the interventions look like. But before we do that, I I know like when I started working in this space 12 years ago, we were talking about the Black Googlers Network. We were talking about Google's racial equity focus at a time when people were looking at BAME or multiculturalism. So, you know, you have been in the space for a long time. Do you think that that kind of lends you all, lends the company to greater scrutiny in some ways? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, talking about the Black Google Network, this has been, the company created this uh, ERD back in 2004. So that was a long, long time ago. And of course, as a global company, we, uh, a lot of other companies, tech companies or not, look to us to see what we're going to do. And I think that we are, as Thomas mentioned, we are aware that there's a lot of things that needs to be done, and we have been making a lot of progress. Talking to Black Google Network, we have been working closely with the leadership to um, explain what we wanted from them, and there has been a lot of commitment from the CEO. Back in 2019, our CEO, Sonda, he uh, wanted to have uh, um, some ideas from everyone within the company, and we have 500 Googlers across the world in different continents giving ideas about how we can improve our equity and diversity. And I'm proud to say today that Yes, maybe we are not where we want to be, but we've made a lot of progress internally today. You can see the number of black and brown people have increased. You can see that when it comes to uh, uh, meetings or when you, when you look at the leadership, you can see there have been a lot of progress. Yes, we know that as a global company, a lot of companies look at us and we are proud to share what we are doing because it can be aspiring to other companies. And we have been one of the first companies to share publicly our diversity report, right? Because we know that we want to do things and we want to be uh, accountable for what we are doing. Wonderful, thank you. You know, this all sounds, it's what we would expect to hear from a company of your size in this area for so long. But I'm gonna come to you, Noah, and just ask, if you can be a little bit real with me for a moment, because you said that you're leading on the race equity work. Now, be real with me. What are the challenges? You know, you're an, you're an ally in this space. Is everyone on the same journey with you? And we're going to talk about allyship a little bit later on. But what, what are the challenges at the moment in terms of, you know, moving this forward? I think um, one of the things we found, again, uh, we've been working on this for a long time, but admittedly, uh, probably not enough focus on it uh, prior to George Floyd being murdered. I think at that point, us, like a lot of other companies, realized actually we took stock and said, wait, have we done enough? And the answer was no. There was definitely more to do. Um, I think one of the first hurdles to overcome is realizing that um, this wasn't just a US problem. It's not just a UK problem. It's a prevalent problem across many, many countries. And starting to educate people on that fact that actually you need to acknowledge that there's a problem uh, in the company, in your country, that we need to address. And it's about all of us leaning in. And so I spend a lot of time with our leadership around the region, really pushing them and saying, I, I know you feel you've handled this, it's done well, but let me share some experiences people are still having. And making it very real, from people getting badge checked, from people being mistaken for catering staff in a micro kitchen just because of the color of their skin. And really pointing out that we have to sort of root out the small things, the big things, all the things, because if one person is experiencing that, it's a terrible experience. I had a colleague, as we started to open our offices, a colleague based in New York who said, who said I got badge checked, and she was sort of quite traumatized by it. She was wearing Google branded clothing. Um, and I phoned, I know our head of security, I phoned him up and said, I know you're training all your staff. I know you, your, your team is really well meaning, but this is still happening. So they retrained the team again in that building that week. And that's just, it's important to sort of call it out and can dig it out of the source. If we wait for the survey results to come in, it's too long. More people have had the experience. And so that's a lot of what we're trying to do is just push and get more people who are allies who can lean into it on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm really pleased you said that because you know when we're working in tech, sometimes it can be, I need to see the data <laughs> before we do anything. So that's a really key point there about you know just responding on someone's experience. And you mentioned a key word there of trauma. 
so in relation to, you know, we, at the same time, we recognize that having that data is important in order to track the goals that you want to achieve. So you have the goal of 20, let me just get this right, not 25%, 30%. Don't let me underestimate the ambition. So 30% representation of black and underrepresented groups by 2025. Is, is that still the goal? How are you getting on with that? <laughs> what are the interventions in place? I, that's still the goal, unless I have an email in my inbox in the last 30 <laughs> minutes that changed it. Um, I think one thing to note, I have to go back to Noah's thing for just like one second. Yeah. I think the important thing for me is to remember that these organizations are still made up of people. And when you show up to work every day, there's going to be human interactions, like, right? Google is a microcosm of society. And so in that, any harm that can happen in the world as you walk through it, as we walk through it as black and brown people, where there is any power at play, there is the capacity for harm to be done. And while we've got to root it out also, we just have to, we have to acknowledge and move through it as well. Because ultimately, we recruit people, and they bring themselves to work. Um, and I think that acknowledgment of the need for education that Noah pointed out is super, super key. But I, I, I did want to remind, Google is a great brand. I enjoy my time in this company and this culture. But ultimately, we are people interacting every single day. Um, the goal is still 30%. <laughs> uh, but I think. The goal and the ambition that you see in things like the CEO notes are really the direction with which we're traveling. So there is an importance in the number, uh, but then there's also the, the back math that needs to happen, right? So largely, that data set specifically is based in what we know to be true about the US, what we need to hire in the US. But people like Noah, when they see that direction from our CEO, gets with the racial equity working group and says, okay, but what are we gonna do in England? Right? We have this community of black people who are underrepresented in our organization, in our walls. And while we may not have the precise data that gets us to 30%, this is our ambition. So I think, yes, the goal is still 30%. We are making progress. Uh, and I'm really proud of the progress that we're making. Uh, and then we are also experiencing challenges, right? Like, talented people have more choice than ever about where they work. Um, and some people have gone off to do really incredible things outside of Google. And so uh, I am still keep in touch with them. I do. I actually had a call yesterday with a, with a guy in Chicago who left to run his own franchise. And he's like, how's London? It's like, it's good. When are you coming back? And he's like, ah, great. Uh, good to see you. <laughs> um, so I do. I keep in touch with as many people as I can. Um, we, we have a term called Zooglers, which means you left Google. Um, we keep in touch. Oh, and go, yeah, what? Zooglers, did you say? Yeah. With an X. X <laughs> so X Googlers. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, so the goal is still the goal, it's still the ambition, we're still driving it. I think when we look across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, we're segmenting what that means. Um, but we are still very committed to achieving the representation that we need. Can I just ask, what, do you have any particular, an intervention that you could share in, that will be an enabler for reaching that goal, which is focused on inclusion, for example? Because we talk a lot about the diversity, but what about, you know, voice, decision making, the things that we, we, we've heard so far? So I think the, uh, in, in our region, a lot of countries have different legal frameworks on what data you can collect and sort of what targets you can set, et cetera. So we've focused a lot on how does the process work for bringing new talent in or for looking for talent for roles. Um, and this is where we, the, the recruiting team, the staffing team, the organization Thomas works for is a huge help here. But we put a lot of pressure on leadership to lead the way on this because we can't have um, the recruiting team being the police on this for us saying, you can't do this unless this process runs this way. We need leadership to be bought in. And so we spend a lot of time slowing processes down to get a diverse talent pool in the mix for a given role. And that can mean taking uh, an extra month or two months, doubling the length of time. But we sort of hold back the process until you've got a diverse pipeline, and then say, now let's go into the interview process. Um, we try and run the interview process to be about who's the best candidate. But if you put in fantastic candidates into your pipeline that are from a lot of different backgrounds, um, the odds are you'll end up with uh, diverse outcomes 
uh, going in there. If you don't spend the time to make a diverse pipeline and you go the easy route, which in a lot of our countries is going to mean a pipeline full of white men, um, the odds are you'll end up with a white man. And so there's a big emphasis. And Thomas has helped me with roles I've been recruiting and takes me aside and says, more time. You haven't spent enough time. And sometimes we haven't found the candidates, so we go and spend another week or two, three, two or three weeks, have more conversations until the pipeline uh, is strong. And then you feel, okay, now it's time to interview and find the best candidate amongst this super talented, super diverse uh, pipeline. So we try and do that for we big focus on the more senior roles. And actually, my team, which uh, as you know, I think we've hired sort of 70 or 80 people this year, they're all doing it as well. I spend time with my staffing partners who work with me day to day on more junior roles, and they slow things down. And my team gets the message and knows they have to spend the time. And so then they actually do sourcing parties and say, we can speed it up by helping the staffing team find this talent to put into the pipeline. And so they get engaged in speeding things up. Yeah, yeah also to add to what uh, Noah said, uh, we work, the BDN group, we work closely Sorry, with- Sorry, which group was that, Rosalind? The BGN, the Black Google Network, we partner with the recruitment team to make sure that we have a diverse and inclusive pool of talent. So two or three years back, we had a specific program where we partner with them to go and speak to university because to have that pool of talent, we need to go out and look for those talent and encourage those the people from minority community to come and apply to job at Google. We also do sometime events. We had one in September, what we call it the mosaic events, where we invite people from a minority background, brown, not only black, but also other minority to come and spend some time with Googlers to understand what it means to work at Google, what is the process to be recruited at Google. And also, in, because it's not only about recruitment, it's also about retention. So internally, we have a program to return people from minority group to understand, okay, if they want to leave the company, they have, we have a, a group of people that's going to go and talk to them, make sure that they are not leaving because of diversity or inclusion issue, but because of other things. So we, we are not where we want to be, but we have been making a lot of progress and we can see the result when you come to the office, the number of minority people, when you look at the leadership team as well. Really good that you're looking at the exit experience as well. And I would imagine that you're also looking at like, um, I was reading some research recently that's, that spoke about stay interviews as well. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if, do you kind of like check in with folk to have a gauge of their experience during their time within Google as well as the, the exit? Yeah, different people will engage. We actually have a team, um, it's called the Stay and Thrive team. And so different people will engage with that team at different points. So maybe I'm going through something and I want to talk to someone about what my options are within Google. We also have, I think another component of that is our internal mobility team. So I've been working and recruiting, but I actually want to go work and go to market. How do I get there? What does that mentorship need to look like? What are the experiences that I need to build to look like to do that? So I think we have a well-resourced people organization that is trying to make sure that the experience of Googlers aligns with what we espouse our values to be. Thank you very much. Now we're going to kind of switch topic. Um, so as we know, and this is a conversation that's come up th um, throughout the festival, is the, the range of racial bias that's showing up in um, big tech data platforms and you know, other forms of, of, of different ways that it shows up in our software, for example. Now, I know that Google has taken some product, product adaptions to respond to that. So for example, it might be about listing black businesses. It could be about so the development in your camera app in, in being able to, to respond effectively to different skin tones, for example. So could you talk to us briefly about what was, how did that, what was the internal process for that? Um, was it something that the, the BGN, the Black Googlers Network were like, come on, we need to fix up on this? Could you talk to us about what that looked like internally? Thank you for the question, Maria. Um, yes, you are right. We've made some progress when it comes to uh, software development, AI. And um, I'm not going to say that it came, from, it came from the BGN necessarily because, you know, Google it, what is, what is our mission? Our mission is to make the world information 
useful and accessible by everyone. And when we say everyone, it's everyone across the world. No matter your race, no matter your countries, no matter your, your genders, we need to make sure that the world, the, world the, the information is accessible. So the company from the top have made a lot of decisions to improve, for example, the skin stones. If you look at the cameras, when you look at the cameras now, you can see that the skin stones for everyone has improved because in the past, some black or brown people was complaining that on the camera, the skin so doesn't reflect the reality. But if you look at the latest pixel, it has improved a lot. If you also look at, um, I mean, there's many, many areas when it comes to software, when it comes to making uh, the translation, for example, our, we had our next, next is an um, online meeting for the Google Cloud team. It happened two days ago. Our CEO mentioned that now we have a lot of more translation in different languages available because we need to make sure that like there's, we have at the moment, I think, 135, so languages from Africa, from South America, everywhere. I was surprised to see Lingala. Lingala is the language spoken in, in um, Democratic Congo. It's available in Google Translation now. So we are making a lot of progress. It's not, it doesn't come from BDN. Of course, we have our, our say, but it's a, a common effort within different part of the organizations. I don't know if you want to add something. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Annie Jean-Baptiste and the work that our product inclusion team does in providing the guide for our product teams to say, if you're building a product that you want to be used for everyone, have you considered this? Have you considered this? Have you considered this? Have you considered this? OK, now let's go to market. So I think uh, there's a whole team at Google responsible for trying to hold our products accountable to truly build for everyone. Um, and so I have to shout her out. Otherwise, uh, I won't be on stage ever again. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> but, but I would give, so I would give credit to groups like the BGN or Googlers. We have a lot of um, internal forums. Uh, we have TGIF on a fairly regular basis, which is company-wide. We have each of the big product areas has uh, regular all-hands. And we have uh, what we call dories, which are open question uh, lists. And Googlers are typically not afraid to ask anything in those questions. And so when things aren't in the right way or there's something that people aren't agree with, they'll ask the question. And leadership tends to lean in and go, well, I better have a good answer for that. Or I better go come back with a good answer for that after I check with the product team. So there's those bits that also hold us to account. Um, to do a better job. So it's not that every engineer is, sets out and gets it right the first time. Any Jean-Baptiste team does a great job for putting guardrails in and setting a process in place. But there are also the guardrails of just uh, the Googlers themselves. And then users will come back as well and say, hey, this isn't working. I'm unhappy through Twitter, through whatever forum. And so we try and listen for those things as much as we can. Perfect. So it's about responding to those different voices. OK. So Noah, we kind of touched on allyship earlier, but I'd, I'd love to just revisit that for a moment because you know, two years ago, it was mind blowing. You know, we had people responding to racial injustice, white people who were talking about, you know, they were coming to, a, to this with a completely different frame of mind. You know, what can I do? How can I help? But I have to be honest and say that I'm seeing the momentum's kind of been lost a little bit. And so a question to you, how, how are you keeping the momentum going at Google? Um, and, then, and then also, how do you stop from, how do you stop from, because it can be quite tempting to go into savior mode as well. You know, I'm going to be the voice for all of these different marginalized voices. So yeah, what's happening within allyship? This is a great question. Um, and there's definitely been an arc. Um, I think we went, you know, prior to George Floyd being murdered, uh, many of us, and I'd count myself included, would have said, I feel pretty well educated on racial equity to the extent the term was used. Um, and then I realized, uh, like many of my white colleagues, uh, that no, I was deeply uneducated. And so there's definitely a period where the people who wanted to lean in realized that actually it's not about being a savior, it's about learning and saying, actually, where am I really in this? What is the real experience for my colleagues? What happens before they even come through the door of the building? How can I understand more about that? What's happened in their history? What's, what has shaped um, who they are and how they think about things and how they experience the world? And so a lot of reading happened. Um, we put in place fairly quickly some more uh, internal education 
on the topic for allies, for majority groups. Before we'd had DEI training, which uh, was effective, but didn't really bring Ooh, history into Tom it. is laughing. <laughs> I'm just proud of the evolution. He's taking you right down the story. But yeah, we did. We had DEI training, like a lot of places, and it was good. It was, it was good, but it didn't really tap into um, the real roots of things. Uh, then we put on a training called Foundations of Racial Equity, which started to go a bit deeper and helped understand a bit more about the context and the reality and sort of the wider circle around a Googler of what they're experiencing, not just in the office. Because there's one thing to say, hey, no microaggressions in the office, don't check badges. Understanding what it took for them to get to the office, what trauma they may have been through, what experiences they've had, how the world looks to them before they even get through the door. And that helped a bit with that. Um, the next thing we've done, actually, we've just launched uh, this week. Well, we've just announced it this week and launching it uh, next week. We've actually partnered with a Historian to produce a series of um, short videos for Googlers on the history of racism and racial justice um, and across the region, just not just... I just want to come in there and say that's so important because, you know, we can talk about EDI training and it completely skips over how racial inequity has come about yeah. and the different, you know, the different... Um, historical injustices that have led to where we are today. So that's yeah. good to hear. And so across, it's a series of, I think, eight or nine videos, one of them just on tea, which um, half of you are probably drinking some or have had some today already, and just pointing out the history of that, of how it got to Europe from China. Porcelain came from China, but then actually it needed to be sweetened. And that's where the triangular trade came in of the slave trade of boats from Bristol uh, taking some products to Africa, Africa, uh, the picking up then slaves or enslaved people and taking them to the Caribbean and bringing sugar back to Bristol. And so the ships would sort of run their triangular thing and understanding that history of saying, well, wait a second, actually, all these sometimes simple things, there's actually a deep history of racial inequity attached to them. Um, and then the final thing I touch on is we've got a set of leader actions for our senior leaders and actually we're rolling that down to directors of things uh, we want them to sign up to, specifically around racial equity, and sort of doing an audit to say, are you leaning in on this? Are you leaning in and making your team has sort of uh, gone through the training, like Foundations of Racial Equity? Uh, are you leaning in on your recruiting processes? Are you leaning on and checking in the performance management process that there isn't inequity? So really trying to hold people to account uh, across the region. And so I guess the allyship hopefully builds by getting people who are uh, more understanding of this. They start to lean in and actually try and make a difference uh, and help. And it's not about being a savior. It's about doing what's right. Um, there's not really a choice here. You've got to find a way to sort of make this right and make it better. I love that. This isn't really a choice. Thank you. I think another interesting thing that's been happening in those circles that Noah's talked about is there's been explicit conversation about not taxing black or brown people to deliver and do these things, uh, which I think has been really exciting. So he talked about the video series and it's coming out next week. And there was a whole portion of the conversation that was like, black people might not want to watch this. And if they don't, do not set an expectation that everyone on your team watches this. Um, and so I think that has also been an exciting part of how allyship is showing up in the workplace. Let's not encourage people to relive their trauma. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And I love that some of your resources are available externally as well. So that's thank you for sharing. Only because I'm nosy, before we go to Q&A, can I just ask what's coming up? So any top secret information that you can share with us, you know, we'll, we'll keep it between these, um, these walls here. Any more Arsenal legends that you've got coming up for your own campaigns? <laughs> Anything coming up in the UK well, we should be looking out for? I think um, when it comes to racial equity, I think we still have a lot of work to do. And so I'd hesitate to say, you know, you know uh, that um, unfortunate George Bush moment across the uh, top of the aircraft carrier saying mission accomplished. We are not at mission accomplished. Uh, there's definitely work to do. So I don't want to sort of say, uh, here's brand new stuff that's coming because the old stuff hasn't worked. I think we've got to lean in and get to the targets and objectives we set. We've got to get to a point where we don't have those incidents of people being badge checked because of the color of their skin or being misidentified in a micro kitchen as being catering staff versus um, being a developer uh, just because of the color of their skin. So there's more work to do there. We look each year, we have an employee survey. We get an inclusion index out of that. There's still gaps in the experience as you look through people from underrepresented groups. And so we need to sort of make that right uh, and get to as close to parity or at parity as possible. Uh, and then 
externally, we've done some things, I didn't speak about this earlier, like the Black Founders Fund. We've done two rounds in Europe, uh, providing uh, no conditions attached funding to startups. We did a $2 million round in 2021. We did a $4 million round this year, touching, I think, 60 to 100 startups. We just did one in Africa for $4 million, touching another 60 to 100 startups. So we're looking to do more of that. Uh, to provide sort of the, the foundation outside of Google as well for more black entrepreneurs, black developers, black people in tech to have a foundation to start succeeding. Hey, thank you. Yes, to, to add to what um, Noah said, looking externally as well, I don't know if you're aware, two day, three days ago, we, we talked again about Google for Africa because if we want to make sure that... <laughs> Yes, if you haven't watched it, go online, look for Google for Africa, there's the uh, live stream there. So we, we mentioned last year our CEO make a uh, um, commitment to spend one billion over the next five years to help improve the connectivities in Africa, but also help some startups. So we are not just looking at research equity internally, but we are trying to do something externally because we want to make sure that we are a company who serve everyone around the world. And it just, just on the Africa thing, if you're a geek, um, like I am on some of these things, we just landed fairly recently the first part of our fiber optic cable across yes. uh, to there. Google and Cloud. If, Digging into what fiber optic cables are is super cool. And I know the, there's a woman in the London office who negotiates some of these deals, and she was showing me a profile of these cables that sit under the sea. And it starts with something quite small, and then you look at it, and it's all shielding and shielding until you get this tiny bit of glass at the center. And this is what's carrying terabytes of data uh, over the ocean. So we've landed, we're having a multi-point cable landing across Africa. There's a part landing in Ghana. Uh, there'll be a part on uh, one of the islands off Africa, which had no, I think, St. Helena, which had no connectivity and then it'll go into South Africa as well to provide multiple of bandwidth to the continent that we haven't had before. I love our work across Africa, and I will be in Nairobi in a few weeks, but I also think in London, we will show up. Like, my role is new to Google as of a year ago. I think it's how do we continue to be in spaces like this? That doesn't mean I will be everywhere or can respond to every LinkedIn note, but I think continue to show up, be a part of this dialogue, holding our leaders accountable for the commitments that we have. That's what's next, more accountability. Thank you very much. As I said at the start, we're going to open out. Oh, we have a question ready. Excellent. We've probably got time for two questions. Good morning. It's so great to see what Google's already doing in Africa and in Europe um, specifically. My name is Oyen. I run boot camps for black women to get into tech. So you've mentioned about actually getting 30% of the Google workforce to be from ethnic minority backgrounds. Do you have any specific stats for where you are right now? And also, how, many, how much of that is really black women specifically? So black women specifically is the most underrepresented group from my perspective at Google. So I will say that out loud and up front. The stats that we have, the country that has the most data, and I'm going to get it wrong, but it's in the diversity annual report, so I'm not going to pretend to get it right, is US-based. Um, so when we... When you see some of those mantras at Google, I think this, the second question is, okay, which country specifically are you talking about? Right. We have some interesting data about the UK, and we're at the point of, I think, of applying that data internally to build a more representative workforce. We have not released that publicly yet, but it is, there's a lot of pressure to do that soon. So I think we look at things like, what is the talent pool? What is the racial makeup of the country? What are our commitments? And then in conversations with folks like Noah and myself, uh, when do we go public with this? So the answer is, yes, we have some data. No, I can't share it right now. But yes, it is very top of mind. And we have got a lot of work to do to make sure our black women have the experience we want at Google. That is a really great question. Thank you for asking it. I'm getting the, the list wrap up gesture. <laughs> um, OK, we've got time for one more question. And I think you had your hands up first. Sorry. Who was it? Hello. Hey, hey thanks. Um, on, on social media channels like Reddit, YouTube, um, Twitter, there's some spaces where developers will talk about can you hear me? 
No, yeah, yeah. yeah, on social media channels, there's spaces where developers will talk about when they interview for some large tech companies. Um, the interview process for white males is a lot less intensive for black males. So what are you doing to ensure that the interview process is consistent and fair and you're tracking that data that, you know, some developers are getting like hard questions because they're black and then white males are getting kind of medium or easy questions? This is literally my whole day job, so I'll take this one. Um, I think first we have a set of what we call inclusive hiring practices, right? So it's making sure, to your point, we're giving consistent interview questions to people. The other thing that, we're talk, that we talk a lot about in people's reflection is how do we make sure black and brown people are educated on what the Google interview process is like? Because I don't think we've done a publicly great job of saying that. And so while I think as, as a marginalized, as a black person myself, you're like, oh shit, this is intense. What the, I got another one? I got another one. How many are there, right? And so while I might have the same number of interviews as a white person, the truth is maybe that white person had somebody tell them, by the way, you finna do six of these, right? And I was really prepared to do six as opposed to okay, I did one, and now I did two, and now I did three. What's wrong? What's going on? So I think there's a process of education, which is actually why I'm going to Nairobi to talk to Kenyan engineers about what our interview process is like. Um, and then we also audit. Like, we go back and look at, for the candidates who say, okay, I'm black, and I'm applying for roles at Google, what are their outcomes? How many interviews did they have? What were the sets of questions? Why were they different or were they different? So I think it's two parts. It's the proactive piece and then reactive, going back and double checking our work to make sure we're, we're producing the right outcome. So thank you so much for that response. Thank you for another wonderful question. And will you be around after your photos to be able to respond to any other questions that haven't been asked? Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for joining. Thank, thank you, you for having thank us. You. <laughs> You're welcome.